I'm Clark Sheffy. I'm an associate partner at IDEO. I'll be joined by uh, Kate Lydon, uh, Jill Levinson, and Tracy DeLuca, who really led the work that um, you're about to be um, shown. And so, um, and I'm just sort of introducing uh, the team around it. Um, one of the things I think is exciting about, about this program and working with an industry association is that there's, all, you look around this room, there's all these people here who can try, you know, one small experiment in, in, in their retail context and report that back into this process and aggregate that knowledge to create a direction forward that's strategic for the industry. This is a chance truly to raise the tide on what we do and, and create impact for the industry as a whole, in, or impact and sustainable businesses around a sustainable planet and all the things we value if we pull together on this. So it's, it's really exciting for IDEO to be working with an industry organization, especially one that's as well organized as the OIA and has such a common, uh, such a shared point of view and shared goals around um, their future. So that part's really exciting for me. And in that spirit, I think uh, what we're really asking for you to do today is participate and contribute your ideas. So uh, we'll be at a booth later today and you'll, you'll, you'll see us um, in, in, uh, in the uh, show itself. And what we'd love for you to do is come by and talk to us, share your ideas, but also as you hear the content today, um, listen actively if you can. There's post-it notes and Sharpies on every table. Uh, put, jot down thoughts, um, questions. I mean, we're really in the question, question phase right now. So um, going wide, looking at a lot of things, asking a lot of questions, not jumping to conclusions or necessarily providing with answers, just some opportunities and places we think um, we can go. So today's really about immersing you in the research, um, ask you to meet uh, a set of consumers that, we're, that we've identified um, as people who represent some of the changing demographics and interests uh, within outdoor um, retail and outdoor activities, and um, engage with them, listen to them, uh, whatever thoughts come to mind, challenges that you're facing, uh, if you can, aggregate those and, and pass them up, we'll, or just leave them on the table, we'll collect them um, later. Um, the other thing I think is really important to remember is that um, you'll, you'll hear some opinions that are maybe challenging to what you think of, um, the, the opinions that you think of may define the industry to date. Um, to us, it's not an either or, it's, that, that represents opportunity. That's, that's a way to open the arms of the industry and, and grow it, not, not sort of a threat to where the core has been. So there's just some sort of preambles to how I'd, I'd love for everybody to take in the content today. Um, is the slide, I'm looking at myself, sorry. <laughs> That's odd, so the future of outdoor retail. Um, so what we're seeing in the world is that there, there's a deep longing for connection that for most people that's going unfulfilled. Um, so, you know, dudes with axes and um, longing to connect to the outdoors. And I think that's expressed, um, we, we heard already this morning, you know, that I, ideas of outdoors have gone into mainstream fashion. Well that's simultaneously a challenge, but also represents a, a deep trend around interest in the outdoors that maybe we could tap into in different ways. Um, and you all have the potential to make that connection happen for people. Um, we also know that outdoors is a fantastic resource to change lives. Um, in, I've, I've limited, but obviously, uh, multiple experiences working in the outdoor industry. Um, it, it, it's fascinating how many people are in the outdoor industry because they had a life-changing moment and then that became their work, right? Um, so that, that's a huge potential. It also can create blinders because you get so focused on what you do and what you know that you forget to see those people who haven't yet been invited and want that chance to become a part of it. So again, um, this opportunity for the outdoors to, to change lives I think is a powerful idea for us. So um, this gentleman who you meet later um, was self-described video game addict, turned into a fisherman and made it his career. Um, Another gentleman, ex-smoker, turned into a personal trainer. Um, and interestingly, really not with much support of his peers, he sort of invented that path for himself because he was invited in the right way by people that weren't necessarily in his peer group to begin with. And it's happened to so many people, and that's why I'm here personally. I want it to happen for more. Um, at the same time, we're talking to the public with imagery like this. We tend to put forth um, a core, a very aspirational, that the guy who's bivouacked on the side of a rock and crusted in, in frost, those kinds of Im images inspire the core. And they're about adventure, risk, and the extreme. Surfing enormal, enormous waves. These kinds of activities that we go like, yeah, but other people go like, holy shit, that's really scary. 
So while this can be inspirational, and it is to a certain group of people, it's not always accessible. It's not always that, that welcome in. And um, so if, if, you, if we all were to think back to our own introduction to the outdoors, it might be through a relative or a friend or a, a club maybe, and there was some moment where someone took the time to explain something to us and we took that first step in. Um, for a lot of people, that might be retail, but how well are we doing that at retail? When you go into a retail environment, are you, are you having a bro talk with the other rock climber? And if you're not um, as knowledgeable as he is, does he kind of say, oh, well, they're not real? Or are they really welcoming you in and showing you the first thing about it and explaining what a rope is, as an example? Um, or, or one of the people we met on the research, um, Jan, who told us after seeing images of the outdoors, she felt like she's being told basically to stay inside, like this is not for you. It's scary, it's dangerous, you probably will die if you aren't as skilled as this person in the image. <laughs> so in order to change even more lives, I think we need to harness our passion for the outdoors and the extreme, but also open the door for people all along the intensity spectrum. Another way of looking at it is you're here at that apex and we use this aspirational model of showing, showing those extreme people, the people who are really pushing the edge, and we assume that everybody else aspires to be that. Um, and they're your core, and, and actually there's a perfectly good business to be run there. I don't want to suggest that that isn't a good strategy. It is a good strategy. It's just not the only strategy. There's also the, all these other people, this population of people who you can lead in, who you can invite into the outdoors, um, but are you know, now either turned off or tuned out or finding their own ways that actually aren't through our traditional channels and our traditional way of approaching the industry. So um, people are multiply faceted. The way they think and feel and act can change based on life stage, mood, or context. Like the average rock climber who's afraid of bugs and unsure about hiking, or even the core of your core can be supported and engaged by this new definition. Um, for less extreme consumers, the outdoor is less about getting lost in the badlands and more about playing horseshoes in a city park. But maybe, that, maybe that's the way in. Maybe there's a connection point there and we're, we're missing that ability to connect, connect those two behaviors or it's finding an uncharted trail, but also exploring their own backyard. The thrill of whitewater kayaking, but more often about relaxation of drinking coffee in an outdoor cafe or, or beer. I know many of us prefer beer. Um, so what we'd like to introduce you to is maybe a new perspective on the, on the outdoors. The new definition of outdoorsy is being outside. <laughs> to me, that that could be the outdoors. When you hear the birds chirping, that's part of the outdoors. I consider myself outdoorsy. Many outdoorsy people just observe, sit down and watch birds eat worms, you know? Being outdoorsy definitely expands way beyond camping. I'm definitely still an outdoor enthusiast. Um, but I'm spreading that love, hopefully. I would never say I'm outdoorsy. Like, I really am not good at that stuff, but I just like to do it, because it's outside, and I don't like to sit around. Outdoorsy is not just going outside of your house. It's like, you want to go into nature. I'm becoming more of an outdoorsy nature person, kind of against my will. I enjoy being outdoors, but it's not, it doesn't define me. It's a big part of my life, but it, it doesn't inform every decision that I make. I like, Camping, kayaking, and catching a fish, being able to spend all day outdoors, backpacking, looking stylish, coming to a park like this, breathing in fresh air, moving your body, being exposed to the elements and nature, gardening, walking from my apartment three blocks to Piedmont Avenue to go get a coffee. I'm not getting in my car to go, and in a car you are technically inside, even though your car is outside. Actually, just as an aside on that, I think, I think one, one concept that comes up around the outdoors is that every outdoor experience begins with a three-hour car ride to the outdoors. Like, how many people have that experience? That's certainly my experience. I live in the Bay Area, and so when I think of going out, it's like, okay, three hours to the mountains, and then we're out. Um, anyway, we'd like you to think about this definition, uh, um, moving from this idea of uh, outdoorsy and to something that's outsidesy. So owning a bigger piece of the boundary from the door all the way to the, the core that we've often spoken to. There's a bigger spectrum there and a bigger opportunity, I think, that we can tap into as an industry. So um, now I'd like to invite you to meet a few of these new consumers, um, people who are stretching this definition and, and breaking some of the boundaries that we may put up for ourselves around our industry. 
and we're going to immerse you in their stories and share what we think are the opportunities that are starting to rise from this. And again, I want to reiterate that these are just really early ideas. We're in the first uh, several weeks of a multi-phase, um, nearly year-long project by the time we're done with it. So, um, so this is about asking questions and inviting your contribution and uh, trying some experiments as an industry. So um, asking you, you know, how might you innovate your retail experience to include these new customers, consumers? Sorry. And so once again, asking you to get inspired today. Um, think, think about your own experiences and please bring your expertise. IDEO is not an expert in the outdoor industry. We're the expert in understanding people. We're experts in being curious. But you are all the experts in your industry. And I think together that, that forms an interesting partnership to find some answers over time. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to um, Jill and Tracy, and they're going to introduce you to um, several of these consumers. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So as we talked about, uh, you know, you guys understand your core really well, and what our job was was to go outside of the core and talk to people who are on the edges. And the reason we do that is because we find that people can better articulate new behaviors and new trends and then translate those into what future concepts could look like. So let's just dive in and we're gonna introduce you to Kelsa and a few other people who are finding the outdoors in some unexpected places. I actually discovered this walk that we're taking today on a Saturday morning where I thought I had to move my car and then I got up there and I realized I didn't have to. And so I just kept walking around. <laughs> Purposeful urban hiking. San Francisco can feel really small, that small at all really. It's really the most outdoorsy thing you can do in a mission. <laughs> Hiking's been a big part of my life since I was a little kid. And having a car here, I've learned that the best part is back there up high. <laughs> you feel a little bit removed from the city when you're up here, I think. It's a combination of kind of like covering land, almost like sightseeing, I guess. For that reason, it requires a certain sort of personality. So this is just like a really nice outdoor space that is really easily accessible from the South Bay. And the city has enough stuff to do without needing to go camping. Yeah. But I, I do love to walk, and I could walk from like my house in Wrigleyville to like work in Millennium Park and have no problem with that. And it's a fun way to see the city, explore the city. There's so much to still see that I haven't seen in my seven years here. I actually really like being outdoors. I like enjoying the sunshine. So on a, you know, a day for me is not complete unless I get to go walk around outside and just enjoy the weather. At first I thought, oh, I'm cheating. But the idea of kind of like converting the same personal energy to spending all of that time in the city, it's different, but it's, it's not cheating. I know a couple of reactions I've gotten before have just kind of been like the eye roll, like <laughs> urban hike, you're just looking for an excuse to say you worked out. I mean, what I realized is that everything's relative, and I grew up in this area, and it, it's about as good as it gets if you like the outdoors and don't like nature that much. <laughs> that the mindset for something like that is we're going to be at this all day, and we're not turning around until we finish the loop. I'm definitely like very comfortable being outside for long periods of time without a destination mm -hmm. or a purpose. <laughs> might sound a little different than what you're used to. Uh, what we're seeing is that for people who are more of this outsidesy mindset, uh, the, the outdoors and nature actually just starts on city streets, so right outside their front door. And maybe if there's tall buildings around them, that's still nature to them because nearby there's a couple little trees. Um, also that the outdoors and nature's, nature happens every day. People are really interested in having it happen every day, not just waiting for the weekend, or not just waiting for a vacation that comes once or twice a year. Also, it includes everybody. So it's so easy for people to get involved, especially when it's in the city or it's right outside their front door. Everybody is included in the outdoor, and that's really important. So these observations led us to our first insight, and that's really about finding the, the new outdoors right outside your front door. So for Kelsa and all the other people who are like her, the outdoors, like Clark said, isn't a long drive to a state park. It's just right there. And so we look at these as opportunities. So for you, how do we take this insight of being right outside the outdoor and think about the opportunities that it inspires for in retail? And that includes how might we guide people to unexpected activities in their backyard? 
So imagine, what if rooftops all over the city were actually the, the place that you really wanted to camp rather than going to a, a campsite? What would that look like? Imagine the offering if we provided a seasonal subscription service so that quarterly people would receive something in the mail that introduces them to a completely new activity like rooftop camping. Um, take a moment and think about what would you put in a camping kit for people who can't actually get out to campsites and they want to camp in their on their roofs, in their backyards, on their porches, just around their neighborhoods. Uh, if you want to take some time and write down on your post-it notes, go ahead. We'll, we'd love to see those ideas later. Also, a small-scale version of this could actually just be, how do you merchandise things in your store? What, what products do you put together? And what story do you create around it to give people a sense of the experience that they're going to have? Another idea might be, how might we show up and be where and when people are outside every day? So instead of having them have to come to you, how do you put yourself in the places that they already are? So what if you could actually have a store where the outside the consumer is? Maybe it's a neighborhood park. Maybe it's next to an outdoor cafe. Um, so think about what would you outfit your truck with? What supplies would you have? Would it be perfect picnic supplies? Could you pull up with a trailer that's filled with bikes so that people could rent them for the day? Uh, what experiences could you create in a pop-up pop like this that caters to the people that are outside, outside Z? So the big opportunity that comes from this is really isn't simply be where the action is. So let's move on to the second insight. So we're going to introduce you to Holly and a few others who are communing with nature in completely different ways. Urban homesteading. Technically, I guess this would be suburban uh -huh. homesteading because we're in the suburbs. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. Really? <laughs> it does taste like cucumber. It does. <laughs> now, I don't know if I speak for like all the homesteaders or just myself, but there's a little bit of it that kind of reminds you of your grandparents. Another one is that like sense of accomplishment that you, you know, grew this yourself or like making jam, teaching it to another person. You bond with them and, and, and one by one everyone just kind of starts like knowing each other in town through things like this. This is cheaper than buying organic at the store, so. Agriculture is a big component. Being connected to growing food, the sense of sustaining yourself, literally. At their age, the, everything is awesome. Mm -hmm. So literally seeing ladybugs in a tree in a city park almost has the same kind of awe factor as seeing like a huge waterfall. They have this piece of property and they'll go out for weekends at a time and just really learn how to like cook over the fire and have a really small footprint. And that sort of stuff I think is I'm finding more appealing. Learning how to gut fish and chop wood and do things that are more fundamental. William Sonoma starting an agrarian section. Chicken coops are about $500. It's funny, that was actually like the hot propaganda against me during the election. Like they sent out a letter to people like, if you uh, vote for her, you're guaranteed your neighbor will have chickens and bees like living next door. I mean, there are people out there doing drugs and we're just trying to grow a garden. <laughs> we're just trying to make jam. When we see that video and we hear stories like Holly, is telling her own story. This is about participation. So it's people that, sorry, hot mic. Um, people that really want to engage in nature through these like fundamental skill building. We see people that are looking for an escape from modern life. And we also see people who are engaged in the process. They they care just as much about how a skill is learned or how a product is made as they care about the end product. So we're looking at people who are just getting back to basics. And we know nature has always been about the basic human connection between a person and their surroundings. But now we're seeing there's this extra layer on top that's about learning skills to thrive, not just skills to survive. So knowing this insight, what's the opportunity? How might you as retailers involve people in the process of actually making gear? So really illustrating the craft of the outdoors in your store. So what that could look like is a skill space within your store. You could have a craftsman in residence program where you have a local maker who's making surfboards or tying flies. You could also have classes in these lost arts like knot tying or building a campfire, things that we really saw people yearning to connect to. Um, or you could just simply use the space to highlight products in your store that you're already selling that are made locally or sourced locally. 
So just for a show of hands, how many people out there already have relationships with local makers in your community, whether they're surfboard shapers or axe grinders? <laughs> oh, total hands. Um, that's awesome. So many people raise their hands. There's also a huge opportunity to leverage those connections more. So for us, the big opportunity about this insight is how can we invite more people into the process in your stores? Okay, so now we've, we've heard from people who like to get their hands dirty. Now we're gonna talk to people who maybe aren't as interested in suffering in the outdoors. <laughs> Meet Rosemary and the others like her who are looking for comforts of home even in the outdoors. People who don't camp, they equate camping to like canned beans and hot dogs and like really crappy Wonder Bread buns. And you don't have to do it that way. I make pizza actually. Yeah, I bring non bread and then I'll bring jars of olives and prosciutto and some goat cheese and then I just put the non either on the foil or right on the grill mm -hmm. and make pizza. <laughs> it's really easy. But my mom always would cook like really good food when we go camping we'd have like steak and cornbread and in my mind especially the kid like a gourmet meal when we camp which I think is really important because that elevates your experience for sure. I have so much stuff that I just never use it's like snowboarding gear. You just feel like such a clown when you're like oh I got goggles, hat, gear, like everything you're just like the amount of effort and money to pay like it's such an expensive sport. There's a lot of companies that make clothes for fishing and stuff like that but I fish in my normal clothes most of the time, you know, so I feel like. My boss has brought me back from the taco show a fishing jersey, and I put it on and I was like, I feel like this looks ridiculous. It has like a big hook on it. And... Kind of like bougie, design-oriented, hip city people with this notion of really cool products and go into the woods and still be kind of trendy, you know what I mean? You don't have to sacrifice everything at the door for Birkenstocks. I feel like things in these types of stores are more for like people who do it as like a profession or like really competitive and I'm kind of get intimidated by like stores like these because I feel like oh you have to know exactly what you're talking about if you want to like shop here. Well I like yoga too oh, yeah. so this is really interesting. <laughs> Most people aren't like putting a backpack on and going out in the woods for three weeks. So there isn't really that need for like all your silverware to fit in like one little tin because most people are going in their cars. No need to bring a sleeping bag if you've got room for a comforter. I don't get it. For me, I love pampering myself in the wild. You know, and I bring toiletries. I like to be fresh and not just be super grimy. Adults want to like give their kids a camping experience because they camped when they were kids. They don't want to go and like buy all the equipment and then own it and have to store it. So they have this like nostalgic thing surrounding camping and that they like, feel like they really need to ex you know expose their kids to it. Camping is being out in nature and it doesn't it can be whatever it wants to be to that person that wants to get out there. So you guys were all laughing about the don't bring your sleeping bag, just bring a comforter. <laughs> but actually, um, this talks right to one of the things that we thought is creature comforts make the outdoors more enjoyable. So if you could use that comforter as a lure or something like it as a lure to get these outside the people into the outdoors, then why not? Uh, another thing is that gearing up is actually a burden, especially for people who like to dabble in different activities. Imagine if you know you didn't just self-identify as a kayaker, but you were interested in kayaking and stand-up paddleboard and you know mountain biking and all these things, and you're not really going to take the time to get uh, really good at any of them. You just want to do them because they're fun. Considering buying all of that gear is really overwhelming for people. Another thing is that the challenge. Uh, is doing just a bit more than you know. So it's not going from zero to 60, it's just going from zero to six. So for us, the insight here is that for people that are beyond your core, they don't always want the outdoors to be too different from real life. And you've heard it before with the extremes, that's great, but what about for the outside the people? How do they find their place in the outdoors? So an opportunity would be how might you draft off of what people are already interested in and lead them outside. So a really simple way to do this would be, what if there was an app that would pull from someone's favorite social media sites 
uh, things that they're already active on online, pull that information in, and then suggest new activities based on what they already like. So in this case, maybe the woman finds out that she might be interested in foraging. And then it tells her the best places to go to forage. It also tells her which of her friends in her social network uh, would be interested in as well, based on all of their data. Or how might you become a hub for sharing gear as well as knowledge? So speaking to that gearing up point, we have the new consumers. Uh, they're already participating in a sharing economy, like Airbnb or Zipcar. They're really used to like renting their stuff out. So what if we created in-store lockers where people could store their gear when they're not using it, and then that gear could be rented out by people who are the dabblers and are just interested in trying it. Then when they like it, they'll invest in buying the gear. And for the owners, maybe they get a little bit of money back every time it's rented. Another thought would be, what if we could track all of the gear? And this way, it would give people information about where to use it and how to use it. So the big opportunity here is, how do we provide an easy way in? So I think you guys know the drill now. On to the next one. Um, we are going to meet Elliot and Erica. So I think Elliot and Erica really typify this way of looking at the outdoors as a place to connect and build relationships. Okay, well, first of all, a long time ago, I only wanted to play computer games, and that was just the cool, biggest, coolest thing in my life. It offered the most stimulation out of anything I'd ever done. So my muscles are just atrophied to nothing, and I was barely eating, too, because I didn't. my body was in starvation mode. Honestly, I didn't appreciate the nature here growing up. After doing that for so long, my parents really wanted me to go and get a job or do anything. To me, it's just all about the experience. Catching fish is just a bonus. You get to go out and spend time in nature and be happy, and sometimes you get a free meal, <laughs> you know, of, of, the, of the most fresh food you could possibly get. In college, I would go outside to study or read or do my homework rather than stay in my dorm. Or if I'm home and it's a nice day, my family likes to go outside and barbecue or go to the beach. I would say it's, it's branched me out to all these people in my family. My biological dad, for instance, I went to visit him like two years ago and I was like, you know what, dad, let's go fishing. And we both caught smallmouth bass in this tiny creek and I could see like he just lit up like a little kid and ever since then he's been fishing. My uncle down in Long Beach, I never really hung out with him too much. So he got me my first set of real nice gear and then last year he took me trotter boat fishing. So we were just on a boat. We didn't catch much fish, but you know, look, at we're out in the middle of the ocean on a beautiful day in Southern California, you know. Couldn't get much better. Every time before I leave, I ask my little brothers or little stepsister if she wants to go for a ride. And so she's not really active, but seeing me be active, I've noticed that she kind of wants to do that more too. I feel like I've made friends with so many people through fishing. If there's a fishing store, I want to go there. And I just start talking with the person. Like, oh, you know, I work in a fishing store. They're like, you work in a fishing store down there? You're a cool kid, I like you. And I'm like, oh, you know, you're a cool guy. You're really nice. It's really not hard to convince people to <laughs> go camping. My uncle, the one that does cycling, always talks about like going on bigger hikes. And he usually takes my older brother, but now that I'm getting older, I would love to do things like that. But I know that he has like the right gear. It's definitely like a big step to go on a big hike like that. Maybe I might be too scared, but it seems adventurous and fun. When I do camp, it's with my family. We do it two or three times a year. Not too often, but we definitely enjoy it. I like being with my family and being away from tech technology, have bonding time between us, and just have fun outdoors with each other. And that just brings us closer. I love going out with my group of friends and competing, but we're all going for the same dinner. You know, it's like, who can catch the most, but we're all gonna eat it. So much of it for me is like the zen, you know? I just like being out there and, and just relaxing. I feel like now I wanna do everything I can in the outdoors. We fell in love with Elliot. It's so hard to imagine that that incredibly positive guy used to play video games 16 hours a day and was in starvation mode. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's for us one of the biggest things was this idea of the outdoors catalyzing relationships. So it was like Elliot connecting with his dad or with his uncle or Erica bonding with her family just by camping. So it wasn't necessarily about the activity, it was about what it enabled them to do. Um, it's also about building community. It's Elliot going to all those different fishing stores no matter where he is and having an instant connection with people. And it also points out that people need a Sherpa. They need a guide to take them into the outdoors. So for Erica, it was her uncle. It was that uncle that was able to like 
help her acclimate to being on bigger hikes and things that she was maybe afraid to do, he made it comfortable to, for her to try something new. So for Elliot and his friends, it's not just about going on a long hike with nothing but their backpack and their survival skills to sustain them. It was really about using the outdoors as this beautiful backdrop for communal and social experiences. So knowing that, how might you really alleviate the burden of logistics so that people can just enjoy the experience? So we found a lot of times the idea of like, where do I go and what do I do when I get there and what do I need to bring was kind of taking away from the purpose of people going outside, with, which was just to enjoy themselves and their friends. So what if people could book campsites from your store or website? So the entire outdoors experience would begin and end in your store. So using Reserve America is really difficult for first timers, especially for people who don't know how to camp or they don't know what an area is like. So you could make that experience easier by providing insider tips. What's the best time of year to go? What activities could you do while you get there? What gear could you bring to make this a really seamless social experience? So for us, the big opportunity here is how can you bring to life all of the amazing and varied experiences that your stores and your products already provide? How could you tell that experience and then bring people closer as a result? All right, this is the last one, but the best one. <laughs> and mostly it's because, um, well, meet Kim and Kate. We're, they're just like a bunch of other people. Um, they love the outdoors, they really do. Uh, they epitomize this big opportunity that lies ahead of you and for you and for the future of retail. So let's watch their story. So have you heard of letterboxing or geomapping? So it's sort of like a treasure hunt. They usually take you to these grand views or like a nice outdoor area. Or just places that people appreciate for whatever reason and yeah. then they want to bring you there. Mm -hmm. But it's really cool because that gets us out and going yeah. to new places. Mm -hmm. I really like it when the clues are written like as riddles, which is what they do sometimes. Beginning with the boulder to the left of the garbage can, partly covered with some greenery. Oh my god, it's built into the dome. Our scuba diver. Ooh. <laughs> Bahama diver. So this is a really tiny book. We'll be putting that in our book and then putting our stamp in there. It's something I wouldn't do it by myself, really. But it's something that I like to do with Kate and mm -hmm. one of my siblings. Um, and it's kind of you know, fun to do something and then you, uh, you get a reward at the end. Um, because I think the outdoor industry, they think that they have to represent extreme sports. And most people aren't extreme. They think outdoorsy people are all skydiving and rock climbing and skiing and helicopter skiing and, and that's definitely not the case. Um, I think I was more uninhibited when I was little, but now I'm a little scared of getting hurt sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, Anytime I'm doing something for the first time, I'm a little nervous just because I, I don't like to look stupid. When you're talking about changing your behavior, there's fear, you know, and anxiety you know, of going into something unknown, and it's hard to get over that. My coworkers actually sent me like an invite to do paddle boarding. Wow, that sounds really cool, but part of the reason that I wouldn't want to try it would be I'm scared, like, personally that I would hurt myself. Part of it is just like fear of failure or group embarrassment. I don't know, I kind of talk myself out of it sometimes. My boyfriend's really into biking. I just feel like I can't keep up with them. I'm not that good of a biker, and so we don't get to go out much because I don't want to hold them back. And there's so many competitive people out there. Nobody's just leisurely about it. But if it seems like other people are picking it up a lot faster than me, I might drop it. Maybe I just don't have what it takes. When I'm with other people, I don't really tend to compete with them. I don't really care much about the calories you burn or the distance that you go. For me, I like to see improvement. I like to push myself. <laughs> That's the other thing about cycling is that competing gets your personal best. And I do that every day. People get to a point where it's like, okay, I realize I'm not the best at everything. I've literally seen ladies come with a cane and start walking off, and next thing you know, they're jumping on the Segway and doing a two and a half hour tour. I started doing Zumba. You feel like a rock star when you're doing it. No one's really buff or beautiful but when you're doing the dance, you think you are, which is cool. 
honestly begins as a social thing. You can ease people into it by just being like, oh, we're gonna go like rafting or swimming in the lake or fishing and we can drink beers and hang out. And I don't concern myself as much with that because I kind of think if it's fun, I'll do it. When you're around people who are doing positive things, you know, it's easier to continue to do those things, you know, because you have encouragement and support and you're getting positive reinforcement. It's a win-win for me because, yeah, I'm burning body fat, you know, and I'm staying trim and I'm staying fit. But at the same time, I like to see the city. I like to see the lake. I like to feel the sun, you know, on my head. I like to feel the wind in my face. Now I'm constantly like, pushing other people. I'm like, you got to go outside. You got to go do something. A good place to fly at a fight. I'm not at work. I have no obligation. I like to think of myself as attuned to like the wind and the water and the elements, you know. Well, that just seems like a lovely day outside to me. A couple of the things that we took away from this is really that fear kills fun. And as you saw in the video, it's not necessarily about danger. Uh, it's about all of those internal things, the mental challenges and the emotional challenges. Uh, and sometimes the outdoors can just simply be about enjoying yourself, just having fun and being playful. So the insight here is about uh, the outdoors being fun for everyone, and not just in the jump off the cliff in the hang glider kind of way, but also just in the flying your kite and enjoying the day kind of way. So the opportunities that come out from this are, how might you welcome people with open arms? So in your, in your stores and even online, how do you make that welcome experience incredibly warm? How can you make that the focal point when you walk in a store? I know that you probably have some really amazing people who uh, are great at customer service. So how do you give them the tools that they need to create a consistent experience? Here we also have just a place to socialize, a place for people to sit down and share tips and tricks or talk about their gear. Um, maybe there's video screens where people can watch video of activities they might like to try and find out where they could go to find them. And just having the lovely person who welcomes them in the beginning and it's less about, uh, as Clark was saying, like, hey bro, are you a mm -hmm. rock climber? Like, where have you climbed? and more just about, well, what do you like to do on the weekends? And then maybe I can point you in the right direction in the store. Another opportunity to be, how might you focus on fun, just for the sake of fun? So I'm curious how many people here right now are tracking themselves with like a Nike Plus or a Fitbit. It seems like everyone in our office <laughs> is, is like addicted to these things. So. That's great, and it's great to know how many miles you ran and, and all of that, but what if it was just more about tracking things that were about making life better, more enjoyable, more fun? So how many city parks have you, have you visited this summer? Or how much sunlight did you get today? And then how could you turn that into loyalty programs? So when people come into your store or they go online and they share with you all the things that they've done, they feel like they've bettered themselves. And it's not just about because they climbed the highest mountain. So the big opportunity here uh, is really just about playing more. And so now we're going to turn it over to Kate, who's going to recap for us a little bit. Thanks. All right. So what you've seen in these stories Oh, here's me again. Um, what you've seen is that in these stories is there are, are a ton of people who love getting outside and actually already are getting outside, but don't yet feel included by the industry. So what this, what this tells us and what this beginning of research tells us is that there are huge, huge opportunities for you guys to actually bring them into the fold, you know, offer experiences and activities that, yes, will lead to purchase, but will also lead to more experiences and more, per more more activities for them as well. So we've seen a lot of content this morning already. It's not yet even um, 9 o'clock. So why don't we do a quick recap. First insight we talked about was how the outdoors really is about being right outside of a lot of people, especially urban folks, front doors. And the big opportunity that comes from that is to actually go where those people already are. What does it mean for you guys to be you know, in a city park rather than focused on lar longer, larger excursions um, that require bigger vacations. 
You know, um, this is about reaching out to consumers like Kelsa, the person we met at the very beginning who was really, really passionate about urban hiking. The second insight, um, back to basics. Again, this was all about the resurgence that we're seeing you know, on a broader cultural level in craft and skill building. Um, the opportunity here is, of course, you know, how can you make this a part of getting outside? You know, how can you invite people into the process of, say, making their own gear, exchanging tips, and exchanging skills even before they get there? The third one, um, the new outdoors isn't always all that different from daily life. Um, again, this is about making things closer, um, providing easy, simple ways in or out, as the case may be, that feel accessible and reachable, um, you know, literally as well as figuratively. Again, it's that what's outside, you know, that's only a five-minute walk and not necessarily the three-hour drive. The fourth insight, um, a beautiful backdrop. We heard so many people talk about the outdoors as a backdrop to meaningful conversations and relationships and experiences, but not necessarily being the focus of it. So we're asking you guys, how can you design ways in retail to bring people closer together that aren't necessarily about um, the backdrop or the context in which they do that? Okay, finally, this is maybe the biggest theme for us, inclusion. Um, number five is all about fun for everybody. Um, it's this tone, you know, we've talked a lot about this new term, outside -sy. The tone of outside -sy is playful. Um, it's not serious and it's not even necessarily hardcore. Um, it's possibly a little more lighthearted. It's flying a kite instead of climbing a mountain or flying a kite as a way to one day build up to being interested in climbing a mountain, perhaps. Um, so, you know, again, this is just about including people who aren't yet ready for um, some of the things we're emphasizing as an industry already. So, for some of you guys, this new definition and reaching these new consumers might feel as exciting and as exhilarating as what Elliot saw when he first started fishing. This is Half Moon Bay where he lives. For others of you, at, at first, it might feel a little awkward, <laughs> um, it might feel a little intimidating, it, might, it might, might feel a little crazy, more like the way Angela felt when she was first learning to ride a bike on the back of her boyfriend's. And there are others of you out here too, you know, where the idea of actually expanding beyond the core doesn't make sense for who you are, who, you're, who your company is, and who you're already reaching out to. Um, and that's totally okay. Um, we're not here to tell everyone that you have to reach everyone. We're just saying that, you know, as you saw in the diagram at the beginning, there's a huge number of people um, that are interested and that we believe are a big opportunity for you guys to stretch beyond what you're already doing. So how do you go from outdoorsy to expanding to the people who think first of how, how they can be outsidesy? Clark mentioned at the beginning um, that one way is to just start experimenting you know, in your own life and in your own stores. So we have three really basic experiments for you. And these are really, these are in some ways a way for you guys to try out some of the methods that we use in our research process. So the methods that we use when talking to you know, Kelsa and Cam and Kate and others. Um, these are all about you guys experiencing, experiencing things firsthand that can give you insights about how you could um, think differently, design your stores differently, merchandise differently, provide different kinds of experiences. So first one, hike or walk, or maybe urban hike, um, a mile in somebody else's shoes, maybe a beginner's, you know, just test, test out a new perspective um, you know, maybe it's looking at the city as a, as a, ex, as a wild expanse rather than, you know, a three-hour drive to a, to a state or national park. That's the first one. The second one, um, letterbox. How many people here have ever letterboxed? A few, including our team, which was inspired by the people that we talked to, um, but not that many. I haven't either. Um, and the second experiment is really about testing out one of these kind of newer, um, I would say in some ways, letterboxing is like an edge outside activity. Um, it's, it's a small but growing thing and it's not clearly in the existing definition of what it means to go outdoors. Um, but it's interesting and it's a great thing to experiment with, testing out one of these, these new ideas. And finally, look outside. Um, you know, the last thing is to really think about looking outside your industry. Um, look at 
new, um, you know, one thing we talked about earlier was how important the sharing economy is, especially to younger consumers. So think about how the Airbnbs, um, you know, try that out. Think about how Zipcar could influence and inspire ideas for, um, for your own industry. All right, so those are all things that will probably start after the show in a few days. We'd like you to try those experiments, but for right now, what we want, what we're asking of you, is to help us build the future of outdoor retail. Um, as Clark mentioned, and I think as Tracy and Jill mentioned, we're gonna be at this booth, um, 56,000 um, today and throughout the show, so we'd love it if you guys would come by, talk to us about ideas, talk to, talk to us about what you're already doing, um, ideas you have for things you'd love to try, experiments that are already on your mind. Um, and a few other things. Also, visit outdoorindustry.org. Join us at the rendezvous in October for you know, the next stage of this long-term project. Um, and finally, seize the new outdoors. Okay, and with that, um, we're gonna let you go to the show in a moment and Kenji is actually gonna close.